Hello everyone, welcome to the Chasing Goals podcast, episode number eight. We're here with Jared. How are we going, mate? I'm great. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good, good. Super, super excited to have you on. Um, I've been thro- um, exploring your Instagram and all the cool stuff that you've been doing. Uh, we were just chatting before about how you've got your gym set up in Thailand and that sort of thing. But do we want to maybe um, give a little intro to yourself and kind of what you do and maybe even how you kind of fell into that sort of training? Got you. Um, so, yeah, my name is Jared Foote. Um, I am a movement coach. I'm a certified personal trainer, yoga teacher, mobility specialist, and animal flow instructor. Um, and I really focus on body weight training, strength, and especially mobility. Um, movement is really what I teach people to do. Movement in all capacities, in all ways. Um, and I teach people to do it as mindfully as possible. Um, so the sort of basic philosophies behind yoga are really important to me and, and what I teach. Although... <laughs> how I move and how I teach people to move uh, doesn't really look like traditional yoga practices, Um, but things like incorporating the breath into mobility training, incorporating, you know, an understanding of our state of mind and things like that are actually some of the keys to becoming more mobile, more flexible, as well as becoming stronger. Um, So it's, it's a holistic package for me. It's mind, body, and spirit. And, and that's what I coach. That's what I teach. Yeah, that's that, that's awesome, mate. I've been um, I've been falling into a bit of the the movement stuff. I was just back in the day, I was just a bit of a, a gym rat, uh, you know, lift heavy, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. But nah, Me too. as <laughs> as I've got older, it's a bit like no, my body needs. I need to take care of myself a bit more. I'm about. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But how did you kind of what, what made you kind of move into the the movement direction? Like, what? How did you find gotcha. that was like? Yeah. I need to start doing this type of thing. Yeah. Well, I, you know, funny enough, I actually still consider myself a gym rat, gym rat. Um, I actually, when I first started my Instagram page, I used to use that as a hashtag all the time. Maybe I should bring that back. Um, And I still, I still really love lifting weights. It's just not as, uh, as um, it doesn't take up as much time in my practice as it used to. Yeah. Um, I started off as a gym rat lifting heavy my inspirations were like my dad who was just the absolute monster of a man Arnold Schwarzenegger like some of the classics right um and that's how I got into it I was just lifting a lot of weight I started lifting weights when I was like 12 years old so really early on yeah, okay. um and while I've never been like an incredibly big um like you know I've I'm not a bodybuilder but I was always a pretty strong kid and I was very athletic. I played a lot of American football, rugby, I played uh, ice hockey as well. Um and so my athletics were really important to me. As I got a little bit, you know, later into my fitness journey and my life, I started struggling a lot with anxiety and this is, you know, this was stuff outside the gym. Yeah. Um but that brought me to I you know I talked to a therapist um, and he encouraged me to try breathing techniques to help me deal with panic attacks <laughs> um, and he also really encouraged me to try things like meditation and it worked I started to get much more interested in these types of things uh, but the problem was I for some for whatever reason a lot of people are like this I really wanted to sit cross-legged on the floor for my breathing practice and my meditation and after five minutes, it just hurt like hell, right? Like my hips were built to deadlift and squat. Yeah. They weren't really built to sit like that. It was pain. Oh, having me at least for years. <laughs> it was painful, especially on my lower back and sometimes on my knees as well. Um, and so I started looking into yoga, uh, like the movement <laughs> practice of yoga, yeah. the asana practice, postural practice. Um And I started using a few postures here and there. I'd usually like cool down after my workouts with some stretches and things like that to help me sit a little bit more comfortably. And it started to work. I started to see some benefits, but I wasn't doing it that much. I just kind of continued along that path. I got more and more interested in the breath work, the meditation, and the postural practice of yoga. And um, one day at the time, you know, I was lifting weights uh, in the afternoons after my job yeah. and I was doing my meditation and breathwork practice in the morning and you know nine to five I was actually working as a tech consultant like slash website designer I did some apps for a few clients I was working for a big consultancy sort of typical nine to five job um, 
a lot of things just kind of crashed down on me all at once, like a uh, family member dying, um, anxiety and stuff coming back, burning out, um, and just not feeling super passionate about my work. So I decided to leave, uh, take a leave of absence actually. And I left and did my yoga teacher training. Yep. Um, I went to go visit some family in Thailand and found a job subbing for yoga teachers when hey, they were that. sick. Yeah. Yeah did my personal training certification online while I was doing that. The gym gave me a job doing personal training shortly afterwards. And um, I just kept, you know, searching for new inspirations, new certifications. Um, I think one of the biggest things that happened to me that really pushed me not necessarily into what a lot of people would consider more like traditional personal training or traditional like yoga teaching yoga I was obviously interested in something in the middle and I discovered Edo Portal. Um, and I'm not sure if you know, or, you know, for our um, audience as well, Edo Portal is probably one of the most widely influential and well-known uh, movement teachers there is. And he kind of coined the term movement culture and movement itself as a practice. Um, he's been one of my more recent big inspirations. Um, and, uh, Anyways, that, that was when I left my job, that was about four years ago. Um, and since I've been doing personal training, teaching group classes and coaching movement full time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's my journey in a, yeah. in a nutshell. That's a <laughs> pretty that's big awesome. one, but yeah, for sure. And I think um, that's, uh, well, that, that's crazy. And then how did you kind of, obviously we'll, we'll touch on a bit of the, the, the movement stuff and what your thought of recommendations are for people trying to like maybe just get into it. What kind of made you um, stay in Thailand? Did you kind of develop, obviously you liked the place and all of a sudden, yeah. What, what was made, made you, yeah, stay in well, Thailand? I mean, there's, there's personal reasons, professional reasons. Yeah. And um, I think the biggest one is just the weather, man. Yeah. The weather is just, <laughs> I love, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian. Yeah. Um, and oh, God, I love Canada. I miss it terribly yeah. when I'm away. Um, and I, and I really do love the winter. Like I love skiing and snowboarding, but there's just something about being on the beach, man. Yeah, I, I, you man. can't beat it. Um, waking up. So I live on an Island. In th- <laughs> Sorry, say that again. Waking up and it's actually warm. You have to uh, put the stuff off your Exactly. Own. Right. <laughs> Year round, just beautiful weather. Um, so, uh, I, um, I live on an Island in Thailand called Koh Samui. Yep. Um, so personal reasons i love the weather i love the culture thai people are incredible amazing food very healthy food too um plus uh, my girlfriend is now there like i have a girlfriend who i see being a long-term partner who is there now so obviously that keeps me around and then on a professional level too um you know koh samui that island and thailand in general kind of used to be more of like a party destination but there was also this sort of subgroup of people who were there for fitness purposes, lots of retreats and yeah, all yeah. kinds of like fitness related services there. And nowadays, especially post COVID, um, the, the sort of vibe of the island has really changed. More people are going for the health and wellness yeah, yeah. related services. And there's a lot less people going to party. Um, and so for somebody like myself who wants to, teach helmet health and wellness related things yeah. it's just a fantastic place to be yeah. um so what i usually do is I, I work with a lot of people online um, a lot of people i used to know from canada and then just people who have found me abroad yeah. i do work with them online and then i work with people in person in thailand as well out of a few gyms actually um and what i love to do is meet people in person and then you know transfer that into an online relationship teach them as much as i can in person and then continue supporting their journey uh, after they leave the island. Yeah, A lot of people I meet and just start the relationship online, um, and that works fantastic too. But it's just a great place to be uh, professionally for me yeah. too. No, nah, it sounds like it'd, it'd be perfect um, both work-wise and just lifestyle-wise. I think it'd be the the, t- the perfect mix. Um, let, maybe yeah. let's touch on yeah, those, those clients. Obviously, what, what would you kind of recommend for someone who's maybe just coming into the – well, they they might have been doing gym for a while, and but they're they're super mm-hmm. super tight. They they haven't been really focusing yeah. on any sort of 
um, movement or you know flexibility or whatever you want to call it. Um, how would you kind of start them off into their journey? Well, I think one of the biggest things and, and actually what I like so much about your guys' podcast is chasing goals. Like set yourself some goals, right? Um, for me, my first goal when I started, you know, obviously I had my squat goal, my bench goal, my deadlift goal when I was the gym rat. And <laughs> still I'm the gym rat, but, you know, more the traditional gym rat, I guess. Um, but then I, you know, then I set myself that goal, like, okay, I need to, I need to sit comfortably for more than five minutes, cross-legged on the floor. So that was kind of my first goal. And I, I picked um, postures and things like that um, to support that goal specifically. Um, and I don't think enough people do that these days. You know, they have very, very generic, poorly defined goals. Yeah. Um, and the more specific you get with what your goal is, the uh, the better you're going to be able to inform yourself or find the information yeah. to create a program for yourself or to pick the right exercises or whatever it is. So um, for a lot of people, it's as simple as like, I want to get rid of my back pain or I want to get rid of my knee pain. Yeah. Um, and those things mean you need to take a very close look <laughs> at how your hips move, how your knees move, and a really big one, how your ankles move. So um those two things I, I get by far the most is back and knee pain stop people from being able to do X, Y, Z, yeah. you know, whether it's just walking up the stairs comfortably or if it's being able to squat with a lot of weight on your back comfortably, like those things might stop you. Assess hip mobility as best you can. Um, check uh, your knees as well, but ankles and hips, those are the two biggest ones. Um and basically, you just need enough range of motion in those areas to be able to do activities uh, without pain. Um, it can be a challenging process to assess, like, specifically how much range you need for different activities. That's when personal trainers and mobility and movement specialists come in. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing is hip mobility, ankle mobility. Find some stretches that will help you with those things. Um I would say one of the best things you can do is getting more comfortable in a deep squat position and getting more comfortable in a 90, 90 position, which is basically just sitting on the floor with both of your legs, your knees at 90 degree angles and your legs at 90 degree angles relative to your hips. So you can, it, those are quick things that anybody could Google 90, 90, uh, or 90, 90 hip rotations is usually what it's called. And, and just holding a deep squat. Uh, resting in that position will help build up some hope mobility. It's really simple places to start, but it's a it's a whole rabbit hole yeah, you yeah. can go down. Yeah, at ninety nine, I've been doing some ninety nineties recently, and that's just my hips just don't agree with that sort of. <laughs> so I've been trying to get better. <laughs> um, that that's when you can start to get into uh, more detailed techniques, right? So um, I uh, I've got my mobility certification from uh, the FRC system, um, functional range conditioning. Um, and they teach this technique called pails and rails. Uh, they, they teach uh, many different techniques, but pails and rails is this, um, this way that you can contract muscles on opposing side of a joint. So you take a simple example. Let's say, let's say your goal is to be able to touch your toes really comfortably, right? Most people understand that when they try and touch their toes, there's this like discomfort in the back of their thighs. Yeah. That muscle where you feel that discomfort is your hamstrings. And if you want to be able to touch your toes more comfortably, your goal is to get your hamstrings to relax and lengthen so it's easier to reach farther, right? What you can try is relaxing as best you can because I know it's painful for a lot of people. Reach for your toes, relax as best you can for maybe 30 seconds to a minute, maybe more. And then after that 30 seconds or so, you're going to actively contract your hamstrings, right? So it's kind of like you're bending your knee slightly. You're trying to fire up that muscle and use as much strength as you can in that muscle without really changing position. It's an isometric contraction. You just squeeze yeah, while, it and hold it, right? In, are you still in the hold at this point? Are you you've really still still leaning yeah, forward, okay. touching your toes? You haven't changed positions. Nice. You're just contracting the hamstring, right? And then you relax. And then you actually um, contract the opposite muscle group, which in this case would be your quadriceps, the muscle on the, the front of your thigh, right? 
And what happens is there's a stretch reflex that happens in your brain and in your nervous system. When you contract an opposing muscle group to the one you want to stretch, that muscle group you're trying to stretch will relax and you will be able to get into a deeper toe touch forward fold in this case. And then once you've done those two contractions for about 10 seconds each, then you just relax for another 30 seconds or so. It's a very, very intense technique, but it's extremely effective for increasing ranges of motion and can be applied to virtually any position, any posture um, to increase your range of motion, but also to get muscles to relax and learn to gain control of muscles in various positions. Yeah. Um, so, you know, most people, and it is a fantastic place to start is with static stretching, right? You just hold a specific position where you feel a stretch for a duration of time. You might increase that duration as you get better or feel better in that posture. Um, but almost everybody notices that they hit a wall at a certain point where you can hold a stretch seemingly forever and you keep coming back, but you just can't seem to break past like a, like a flexibility plateau more or less. And that's when things like pails and rails come in. You learn how to contract muscle groups that you're targeting, the opposing ones, and you will see massive improvements in that range of motion. It's something that I guide people through in classes and through one-to-one -one coaching and my programs all of the time. And since I've learned and started employing this technique with my clients, it blows my mind of the results. You know, as a yoga teacher, I taught static stretching for a long time and I used it myself and it was effective. Uh, but this stuff is like, it's like stretching on steroids. It's just a whole nother level. Um, and I really recommend that people try it, um, assuming they're ready for it because it is a relatively intense technique. Yeah, yeah for sure. I think, is it, would you say that's because what, when you're doing that, let's say you're in that hamstring position, like you said, and you, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So you've, you've got to your kind of end range that you can get to mm -hmm. and then you're flexing your hammies. Mm -hmm. Would you say you're, you're yeah. gaining control in that range of motion, which means you can hopefully get there and you can, once you're down there, you can control it a bit better. Is yeah. that what, kind of what's happening? Yeah, so the, the main thing, and control is a huge aspect of it, and gaining control in your end ranges of motion is obviously a very good thing. Um, the main thing is, is there's two stretch reflexes. Right. Um, and I, I won't use, I'll, I'll try to just keep this in, in layman's terms so that anybody can apply this like right now. Um, there's two stretch reflexes. Let's, let's keep using this toe touch example. Yeah. I'm trying to touch your toes when you're doing that and you feel that discomfort in your hamstrings in the back of your thighs, that is in and of itself, um, creates a reflex. Your brain goes, oh my God, my hamstrings are not used to being this stretched out and the hamstrings contract to okay. resist it, right? So this, this stretch reflex, we actually want to try and let go of. We want to move through this and yeah, do exactly. something, right? We, we want to do something to tell our nervous system that it's okay and that we can relax, Yeah, right? Flexibility and mobility is largely about the nervous system as opposed to only our muscular musculoskeletal system, right? So we need to train our nervous system as well as our muscles. Now that first stretch reflex goes off. Hamstrings are being stretched. They go, that hurts. And they contract and resist against it, right? What we need to do is use the second stretch reflex. When a muscle's antagonist or its opposing muscle group is contracted, that one will relax. Right. Yeah. So this is when the second part of this technique comes in. We want to relax the hamstrings. We want to let go of that first stretch reflex. So we contract the hamstrings and all of a sudden, or sorry, we contract the quadriceps and all of a sudden the hamstrings relax. Right. Um, so that second stretch reflex is like, okay, look, the hamstrings will be all right. I'm going to focus on contracting this area instead. And it basically just shifts the focus. So the yeah. one you're targeting gets to relax and you can get deeper into the range of motion, whatever position you're in, I guess, in this case, the, that toe touch. Um, and if you try that, I, I, I bet you, if you apply it correctly, you'll see a huge increase in your range of motion in, in a rather short period of time. Yeah. I remember um, I was listening to the Huberman podcast, the, 
can't remember what he yeah. Name. Yeah, and they were talking about it. it was just he was. I can't remember who he was talking to, but he was talking about just something about yeah, just. And I, I was just like, I'll give it a go, and I just did a hamstring stretch, yeah. and then it wasn't even whilst you were in yeah. a stretch. It was just get up and uh, contract your quads for ten seconds as hard as you can, and then just yeah. go back and go yeah. again. And it was just crazy the so, difference. Yeah. So the technique he was talking about is is called PNF, proprio proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And it's also very effective. And it's it's essentially the second half of the technique I was just explaining. Um, and so it, it is more even more effective than static stretching is. But this pales rails technique is yeah. is a whole nother level to that. Um, but it's it's very, very similar and actually uses exactly what you're just talking about. I heard that episode as well. Yeah. I love the Huberman podcast. Huge right. shout out to, to Andrew Huberman. Um, but I hope for uh for ourselves and anybody else who may have heard that podcast, mm. just please know that static stretching, especially what he was recommending static stretching for 30 seconds um, mm. at, at a minimum, it will get you to, a, to certain a certain point. And then you will likely hit a plateau is when, which is when you want to start to employ PNF or the one I was just talking about pales and rails. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess once you, I saw obviously with like stuff like the um, Jefferson curl and then people who kind of, are using more weighted, um, I guess they're using, not obviously heavy weights, but they're using weights to kind of, in, in yes. like different positions. Is that also another yes. way to improve? Loaded stretching is another uh, very important technique, but not one I would recommend people try until later in a flexibility journey and, and when they're very, very comfortable and strong um, in the positions that they're trying to, uh, get deeper into, uh, for instance. So there are many, many different techniques of stretching. Um, and they, you know, they are higher or lower priority, depending on where you are in the journey. The, the number one priority is just static stretching, just holding positions for a duration of time and improving there. And then you move into stuff like PNF, pails and rails, depending on what your goals are. Again, the more specific you get with those goals, the better informed you could be for your training program. Uh, but depending on your goals, a lot of people will start to use loaded stretching. Um, uh, I personally, um, I use it uh, quite a bit actually, but I only use it as much as I absolutely uh as as much as is absolutely necessary and no more um simply because i think that you know part of my you know putting flexibility aside part of my personal philosophy and i think more of the movement philosophy as well um people are too reliant on external tools right they want to get big muscles they want to look good and they and they they want to feel good right which are all you know amazing very general goals um but we rely too much on external tools to get there when in reality, all you really truly need is a, a reasonably functioning human body to get most people's goals. <laughs> um, and anything additional is simply, it's like a supplement, right? I'm not going to tell somebody to pick up protein supplements if they're not already getting, you know, reasonable protein in their normal diet. Um, uh, so a loaded stretch is like adding in tools before they're probably necessary, unless it's very specifically selected for your goals. Yeah. There are some instances of that for me and some instances of that for my students, but it's not something I would, any, I would recommend somebody do if they're just starting to get into right. flexibility work or trying to improve the health of their joints or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Our first First session straight into a Jefferson curl, ten kilo dumbbells. <laughs> yeah, pick up the heaviest weight you can, do a Jefferson curl. You're gonna hear a crack. <laughs> Probably not the best thing, but I do love Jefferson curls. Amazing <laughs> exercise. So, would you say like with the a good progression would be just if someone's like new and starting, you'd probably like yeah. you want to start with maybe like your your normal kind of you're stretching, you you like you're just holding for thirty seconds to a minute, whatever it is, kind of do that until you feel like you've kind of tapped it out and then we're moving on to maybe that uh pails and rails stuff um mm -hmm. all that kind of that could be like the next phase that you're stretching to improve even more and then we're mm -hmm. we can start adding in some kind of weighted stuff as well at you yeah. know would that be a good kind of like loaded little, pro little progression you, you've got it exactly right static stretching to start 
start with 30 seconds, work up to a minute or more. Um, if you're seeing progress, just keep going with that. Once you start to feel like you're plateauing, employ pails and rails. Um, and, uh, and, and following that, you can start to employ things like loaded stretching and, and, and those kinds of things. But um, again, those are those that's a each of those could be like its own rabbit hole we could get yeah. much deeper into. Uh, but that is a, generally for most people, that's a pretty good yeah. uh, way to look at progressions with flexibility and mobility training. Yeah, yeah nice. Um, I, I reckon we maybe here we'll touch on um, who, who did you kind of obviously you talked about what was it, the um, the guy's name before yeah. the, the the movement? Oh, uh, Ido Portal. So we had Portal. Yeah. Ido is his I first did. name. Uh, yep. And Portal, it's spelled like Portal, P-O-R-T-A-L. Have you heard of him before? No, actually, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I, mean, I, I, I want to look his stuff up so I can see what's going on there. Yeah. But, but actually, if you like the Huberman podcast, uh, he, he's done an episode there too. Oh, uh, he's a very interesting guy to listen to. Um, much more philosophical than scientific, so you've got to kind of have an appreciation for that sort of thing. Um, but uh, absolutely amazing. I think... I think something that's actually really personally, I find this kind of practice movement practice is better explained visually. Yeah. Um, and uh, so while their talk on the podcast was outstanding, I would actually recommend that you go and check out the, um, they did a training session together. Ido took um, Andrew through um, a movement training session. And I think that that was actually much more telling as to what, the, the practice can actually look like it can look like many many different things yeah um but generally the idea is uh mind body connection it's neuromuscular training it is mind and body considered as one system yeah. um and so it's a lot more than picking up weights and 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 building muscle mass um it is about uh coordination it's about mobility it is about balance uh, it's about control it's about speed and power. It's, it, there's many other aspects to it. Um, but, you know, to keep it as simple as possible, I would say that the idea behind movement training is to find as many different patterns in which your body can move, right? So it's not just how strong can you get in these three patterns, squat, bench, deadlift. It's how many different patterns yeah. can you come up with? Yeah. Um, and can you train yourself to perform? Um, and ultimately that is not only that variability is not only what contributes to longevity and healthy joints and feeling really good as well as looking and functioning good. Um, but it, 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 on a physical level, but it also contributes to the health of, of our brain. Um, you know, we, we have massive problems with things like Alzheimer's and, and, and Parkinson's. And while I'm not a doctor and, and I would never claim to be one, um, it seems pretty clear to me that, that movement is one of the best things we can do to keep our brain in good health. And the more ways we move, the more ways we stimulate our brain, the more neural pathways that we're creating. That's why I love it so much. Yeah. It is, um, very holistic system of training. For sure. I think it, it should like, obviously, you know, we when we were a bit younger and we're like coming through the system, or um, you just kind of talk, go into the gym, lift some weights. Like let's say for like an athlete type thing, and that that's it. Like lift some weights, get strong. But for for a lot of sports, and like unless you're doing powerlifting, um, a lot of sports you need to be strong in like weird positions. Like for, let's if yeah. you take, especially if you take like well, I'm from Australia, AFL football. Um, yeah. The the positions that you need to kind of you know, like tackling or you're on the ground picking the ball up and you oh, need yeah. to, you know, you need, you need to get strong in all these weird positions. Um, so that's why it'd be so beneficial if if this was a part of the, I feel like we, we're getting yeah. closer to where we were probably 10 years ago. Like it, it's coming, Absolutely. Okay. but um, yep. it's still a long way away than where, where it should yeah. be, I'd say. I, I would agree. And I, I also agree that it is, it's coming. Um, I think it's actually coming quite quick. Um, maybe it's just the silo I'm in on like social media <laughs> and whatnot, but yeah. like, it really seems like people are again, because it's a visual, it's such a visual thing. I think when people see it, they get it. Yeah. Um, 
some some people see it and just think oh it's it's weird like you know why but i i honestly think that the majority of people these days are really starting to get it um and uh especially athletes um fighters are another big one like i oh. I, I work with and and uh and see a lot of muay thai fighters in thailand say, obviously sort of um that'd be yeah yeah you got to be strong. You got to be able to move in weird ways and you've got to keep your joints uh, stable in strange positions. And, and that applies to every sport, right? Yeah. You can take a freeze frame of a rugby match or a tennis match or a Muay Thai fight and they're not going to be in these like perfectly symmetrical patterns that you, that almost everybody is working on in the gym, right? Like squats, deadlifts, yeah. bench press, bicep curls. Most people the majority of the time are working on very symmetrical patterns. It, it's almost like somebody's trying to shove their body into like a cookie cutter. You know what I mean? And then get as strong as possible Just only that. within the boundaries of that cookie cutter. But then the second you go outside of that, your, your body doesn't know how to keep itself safe. It doesn't know how to maintain tension. Um, and that's when you get crack pop and you get some injuries. Um, so yeah, it, 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 you're very right. Whether you're an athlete or you're just a normal person. Yeah. Because yeah, honestly, I think, you know, aside from Muay Thai fighters, some of the, most of the people that I work with are just, they're just normal people who want to be able to, I don't know, run around and play with their dog or their kids. Oh. Um, they want to, you know, get into later life and just feel good in their body and be able to do some pretty, I guess, normal-ish like yeah. daily tasks. Um, I still ask people to get specific about their goals. Like for instance, I want to be able to continue going on hiking and, and canoeing trips when I get older. Yeah. And that requires very specific movement patterns that I'm going to be training for my entire life. Right. Um, but I also want to do weird things in the short term, like one arm handstands and one yeah. arm chin ups. And I, I still work on my deadlift and whatnot because strength is still important. Those patterns are still important. We just need to broaden our scope much, much wider. Yeah. It's not to say that what most people are doing in the gym isn't what they should be doing. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's like, I, 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 I have so much respect for anybody who spends <clears throat> any amount of time in the gym. It's like, you're there, you're working on yourself and that deserves a huge pat on the back. But if you want to go to the next step, you want to make sure your joints are in good health. You want to make sure that you're going to get older gracefully and you're going to be able to continue doing some of these activities even into your old age then you need a broader perspective on what your training is going to look like and it can't just be squat bench deadlift run on a treadmill yeah um you might be strong but it, there's it, it's got to change a little bit yeah for sure and if it's if okay, and that's for me now like i'm i'm 30 now so i'm, I'm trying to getting like a little pushing up there. So I want to be able to, you know, mm -hmm. keep, continue to, I love sports. I want to be, you know, play basketball yeah. and blah, 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 run around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still obviously doing all the gym stuff, but that's kind of where I'm at now trying to, and that's why I, I saw your, your Instagram and thought it was like cool, all the, all the movements, but it's also like, just how does he do it? How does he do that sort of stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, do you ever do gymnastics or anything uh, when you were younger? I didn't No. Yeah. Um, I played, I played some sports, but I, I didn't really do anything gymnastics related when I was younger. Um, uh, no, yeah, ah. I, I didn't, I didn't have any of that background. I, I was an athlete and I was yeah, strong, yeah. but yeah. no gymnastics. Um, what I want to touch on, maybe can we touch on the, the breathing aspect of it? Um, sure. Just like the importance and, and, and maybe how one would breathe during their, during their like their session like their mobility sessions yeah. um yeah. is it are we doing is it nasal breathing we're doing while we're, where we're or is it how are we kind of is it long and drawn out well, how does it work if uh so again if this actually this is a big area of confusion um for a lot of different reasons depending on what activity you're doing then there's a optimal breathing pattern for different things so like powerlifters have a really specific way in which they breathe for maximal strength and um 
uh, intra-abdominal pressure to make sure their spine doesn't snap in half when they're holding like hundreds of kilograms over their head, right? Yeah, yeah, They have a really specific patterns of breathing for strength. But let's go back and try and build upon, I guess, the the flexibility and mobility stuff we were talking about. Um, Let's say you're at stage one and you're just focusing on static stretching for 30 seconds. Like you're just starting off. Yeah. Um, to keep the, to keep the breathing as simple as possible, you want to slow it down as much as you can. Always breathing in through the nose, and most people find it very comfortable to breathe out through the mouth. So it's okay. right, like yeah, okay. slow yeah. breathing. Uh, yeah. If you watch most people when they start doing static stretching, um, they are breathing like this. Yeah, <laughs> and their face looks like this <laughs> right like they're going to the bathroom or something and part of the issue there is again we're trying to train our nervous system to relax it's not just the muscles that we're focused on it's the nervous system and it's our brain and one of the ways in which one of the best ways to take control of your nervous system more generally is through breathing So inhales have a slight sympathetic effect on the nervous system. So it means you get stimulated, your heart rate increases a little bit, your pupils dilate, like all these different things happen. You you just, you feel a little bit more stimulated. It's an extremely subtle effect every time you take an inhalation. Yeah. But if you were to lengthen your inhalations more so than your exhalations over a duration of time, like a few minutes or so, you're going to notice like your heart rate really picks up. You, you might even start to sweat a little bit. Um, but then if you do the opposite, if you extend the exhalations, you get a parasympathetic effect. The whole system slows down, right? Everything feels more relaxed. Um, so when you're doing static stretching, I would highly recommend that you try breathing in for three and breathing out for six. One, two, three through the nose. One, two, three, four, five, six, out through the mouth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you want that long right. exhale, that inhale to kind of slow down yeah. the heart rate and calm the mind. Really relaxes everything, calms yeah. the nervous system, will also calm the muscles down. Um, doing that in combination with making sure there's no tension in the head, the face, the neck, the jaw uh, will make a huge difference in how effective those stretches are. Yeah. Um, once you start to get into, some of those other techniques we were talking about, it gets really complex. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, to start with the static stretching and generally whenever you're trying to do something that is not supposed to be super stimulating, it's supposed to be more relaxing, lengthen the exhales and you'll find that your whole body is, and your mind is much, much more relaxed. Yeah. That's, um, that's what I was actually thinking when you're talking about it, when, when everyone's like, <laughs> I was at the, I was doing yoga the other day and it was, I was in some position. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's so funny. You just like, oh, it just, it just happens. Oh, there, <laughs> and, and I'm, I, I'm still there with many things. Um, you know, like I'm, uh, I think I've mentioned it briefly earlier, like to some of my goals right now, um, uh, if, if personal goals, I'm professional and business related goals as well, but, I would really love to achieve a one arm handstand. Um, and I've been working on it for a long time now. It's, it's going to be a multi-year journey. It's already been a year or so. Um, but it requires so much focus and effort and coordination and mobility and, and, and many different things um, that, you know, if I'm not very mindful of what's going on um, while I'm practicing these yeah. techniques I use to get there, I'm, I'm, my face probably looks like this while I'm looking at the floor and I'm breathing like, (laughs) (laughs) right. Um, and it's because I haven't mastered it yet. Yeah. So that, that, that occurrence, you know, that experience of like trying to get yourself into a posture and then noticing you're having that sort of like really sort of panicky, quick breath. That's actually a really important step in the journey. Um, and when you start to master having a controlled breath in a posture or a movement, that's one of the signs that you're actually beginning to master that posture or movement. 
Yeah. Um, and my, my first uh, yoga teacher taught me that. And that still stays really true to my heart. I always teach the technique as early as I can, the, the breathing technique that people should be using during whatever exercise or posture they're doing. Um, but I, I always set that expectation with my students is like, look, it, it's, it's quite difficult thing to master the breathing while also mastering this physical posture. Yeah. Um, so be patient with it. Remain aware of what your breathing is like and know what you want to get to. Um, but don't 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 worry about mastering it right away. You know, <laughs> yeah. if, I'm not sure how, how much yoga that you've you've been doing or, or, or want to do. But if it's been your first few yoga classes and you're still breathing that way, it's like, don't, don't worry about it that's at all. The bad, it, that was it, comes, the bad thing. it comes with time. It was, that's yeah. the bad thing. I've been doing it for a while. So that's why it was so bad. It was just a new position. And I was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> yeah, it's a new position. So it's, you know, your, your body and your mind are going to just t- take a bit of time to, to figure it out. So d- don't worry about it at all. It'll come. And, and then we all still do it. If you're learning something new, it's, it's probably going to happen. So, yeah. Um, I want to touch on, I was just, yeah, I was, as I said, I was flicking through your Instagram and just like how the importance of um, journaling was for you. I saw it was kind of, oh, you've been doing that for a yeah. while and it might do something a little bit different uh, on the podcast, but it, yeah. I, I, it's very, obviously very important um, and a lot of people do it. It's yeah. obviously very good, but did you want to maybe touch yeah. on kind of what you kind of do with your journaling and then maybe how it's kind of helped you and benefited you? Oh, I appreciate you asking this question. Um, because it is actually a very important practice to me. Um, I started journaling um, probably a year or two after I started practicing breath work and meditation um, simply because I, you know, I can't actually remember how I kind of stumbled upon it or decided to practice it. It was probably one of these textbooks I received from my therapist when I was uh, quite young. Yeah. But, um, I started journaling because I just wanted to understand myself better. I wanted to understand what was causing feelings of anxiety. Um, And I wanted to, the biggest thing was just slowing my thoughts down. Right. I think we all get this experience, you know, at some point in our lives, if not very frequently, that the mind just races and thoughts move so fast that we can't even fully process them before we've moved on to another one. And that, that, that's for me is why I started a journaling practice. I can actually slow down my thoughts by taking it into, I'm a very kinesthetic person. Anything physical helps me a ton. Yeah. So turning my thoughts into this thing where that I physically write out allows me to slow them down and to actually process them and consider them. Um, there are, uh, I've tried so many different journaling techniques over the years. I couldn't count them. Um, but the one that I find most impactful is gratitude journaling. Um, and then there's another technique. Uh, so gratitude, I would think as like planting seeds for beautiful flowers, right? And you practice gratitude simply by writing down a number of things that you feel grateful for. Um, it's like planting these things in your mind that hopefully will take root and blossom and create this like gorgeous garden in your mind. <laughs> but the problem for a lot of us is that there's weeds in there right now. And if we don't get the weeds out first, then they might take over all those flowers we're trying to grow. Um, give me a b- brief moment here. I believe it is called... Um, A daily, yeah, a daily record of dysfunctional thoughts. This is a technique that's been used by psychologists um, and psychotherapists for a very long time. I don't remember exactly how. And a quick Google search will pull up these frameworks uh, that you can use to do this. Um, A daily record of dysfunctional thoughts is a technique where you can write down things that have been going through your head that have been making you feel negative. Um, and then respond to it in a very specific way that helps you see things in a new perspective and generate a positive outcome and positive feelings from that outcome. So most of us don't realize that there are thoughts and voices going on in our head 
that affect us on a really intense level and that are going so fast we can't see how silly they actually are sometimes right um and so by journaling them and and using that technique uh, writing down these thoughts and how we feel about these thoughts and then looking at them from a different perspective and finding a positive outcome and positive feelings by fully processing them we can sort of so to say like root out these weeds in the mind and yeah. then through gratitude practice we can start to plant seeds of, of nicer things and you know uh, yeah. metaphorically grow a beautiful garden um i think journaling for me is is, is one of the most impactful things that I've practiced um, on a mental and a physical level, because if it wasn't for journaling, I would not have been tracking my workouts either. Um, and I wouldn't have a record of how I've been feeling. Um, you know, there's, there's techniques that I've used that help me build more confidence and understand myself better. And so a lot of the reason why I'm sitting here talking about all this stuff with you today is because journaling helped me figure out what I love, um, what makes me happy, what doesn't make me happy, um, and gave me the confidence to take some leaps of faith in myself and start a business doing what I love and teaching what I love. So that's why journaling is so important to me. That's two ways that I would recommend people start a journaling practice. Um, and I, I'm really happy that you asked that question. I'm going to plug something here. Um, I, I, I'm starting a, it's a totally free journaling challenge. It's 15 days. Uh, I'm going to be going live on my Instagram and TikTok pages um, discussing uh, techniques that I use for journaling. And it's just something I'm really passionate about and I really want to share. So I created a program. It's on my platform and you can join it completely free. Um, and it's going to be starting on October 10th. So if you're hearing this before, then you're welcome to join. If you're hearing this after then, it's still going to be there and it's still going to be free. So that's, anyways, that's my plug. That, that's awesome. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Plug as much as you want. <laughs> no, I'll, um, okay. I'll get you to send me the link and stuff and I'll, I'll chuck it under the description and stuff so okay. that people can just okay. quickly go into it, which will be, which will be easy. Beautiful. Um, just a couple more things. And that, that was awesome about the, the journey. I was actually thinking while you were saying it, just, the uh, when you were saying about fast thoughts and stuff, that at night time yeah. my brain just has the most ridiculous thoughts, and I'm like, and I'm just gonna remind myself, oh my like, I, at, I always just think at night, I always just remind myself, these aren't problems that are that big. But like when you're in bed at night, and you're like, because I like, I have we, me and my brother have a business here in Australia, so I'm always thinking yeah. about that, and um, and you're like, oh, did I do that? Did I do this? Did we do that? Oh no, I forgot to do this, blah blah blah, and you're like. It's yeah. It's two in the morning. Don't don't. This is not a big deal. You can wake up tomorrow yeah. morning and we'll get it done. But at this stage, just yeah. get some rest. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I think to some degree, unless we're monks or something, we all like to have some kind of experience like that. Um, I like to journal in the morning. Some people like to journal at night for specifically that reason. Yeah, it's a it's a really great way to sort of get things out of the head that are just running around racing and sometimes also um this isn't a technique that i use but i know a lot of people it does work quite well for um is writing down what you're going to do the next day is almost like you know you've got to do all these things and half the time that might be what's racing around yeah. in your head <laughs> so just writing down the schedule for the next day and then you know maybe a little bit of gratitude to sort of shift focus yeah um it will, it will kind of help to slow down the mind a little bit of deep breathing use that one to two breathing ra ratio um like breathing in for three breathing out for six i bet you any money you'll be in bed like that <laughs> or be asleep like that <laughs> that's fair that's good advice <laughs> yeah. um and i reckon before we we head off it's been an unreal chat i can uh speak to you for ages about all the stuff that you you're doing and that sort of thing <laughs> but maybe just yeah. touch on your like your business and some and your goals and kind of maybe how you how you kind of found you like how you wanted to do it, i guess through the journaling and stuff but then what your yeah what your goals are and what you hope to kind of yeah. do with the business of course yeah um so i i, I mentioned more personally and uh, from a more movement based perspective i i do want to achieve a one arm handstand um a one arm chin up um, and I would like to crack, uh, it, it's not very much, but 405 pounds on my deadlift, which is, that's a very new one. I'm, I'm trying to, I used to work on that a lot when I was more like the gym rat 
Yeah. Um, and I haven't really touched really, really heavy weights in a while. So I've brought that one back just because I feel like it would be so nice to check that deadlift thing yeah. off the list. Um, and because I've got the mobility for it now and yeah. I, I want to use it. Um, anyway, so these are, those are three big uh, movement based goals I have for myself personally. Um, professionally, I'm trying, I am uh, working as best I can to 10 X the number of members I have um, on my online platform, the evolution collective Yep. evolution collective is um, where uh, I have pre-built programs on movement training um, breath work. <laughs> and that's where that journaling challenge is going to be as well. Um, and I also offer my online co coaching service through that platform, um, as well as, you know, some other things, consultations, and I'm going to be bringing live classes back, uh, this year as well. Um, so I want to 10 X the numbers on that business. I have a very specific plan, uh, that I would, that I'm going to use to get there. And I would like to see that happen, uh, by May of uh 2023 which is a very short deadline but i'm convinced that i can do it um and even if i don't i'll adjust the plan and keep working on it yeah um, for sure I, so that, that's that's my business goal yeah that's awesome it, it, it reminds me of um uh remember tim ferris oh no remember he's still around yeah. <laughs> uh, but it ferris. was just the that kind of like the what what can you do to your business or where do you think your business could be in 10 years, but how can you achieve it in six months? But, you know, you're trying to, that, and that's always kind of stuck with me. Obviously, like, you might not get 10 years of business worth in six months, but how can, if you try, if you, you're trying, yeah. you know, you get, and it, it was just something that, um, I remember, yeah, listening to him, and when you said that, I was like, it's very something, Absolutely. That, you know what I mean? Like, let's say uh, you, you're eight times, that's not a loss. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Even if it was two times, <laughs> it would be well worth it, right? Sure, so sure. I, 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 I do really like Tim Ferriss. I read the four hour work week. That was probably another one of those pieces of the puzzle that pushed me to start my own business. Uh, but I actually got this from um, doing a lot of research into Google and, and their techniques. And this is back when I was doing tech consulting. Yeah. Google calls it a moonshot. You shoot for the moon and you end up somewhere in outer space, yeah. right? Yeah. You go for the biggest thing and you trust that you've actually got it and you do attain it. Yeah. And sometimes you will, yeah. most of the time you won't. Sure. But the fact that you shot for it is really what matters and the progress is really what matters. So um, aim for two times and you're barely going to make any progress. Aim for 10 times, you're going to make a lot of progress. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there's still something to be said for uh, a, a attainability when it comes to goals. Yeah, for sure. Um, that being said, if you understand what you're doing and, and why you're doing it, then it, it's it's a great uh, sort of philosophy to have behind your goal setting. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, that, that's that's awesome. And I guess the last thing I, I was forgot to mention to you before the, the pod. So I watch these um, two guys. I don't know if you've seen their podcast, All the Smoke. It's with uh, All Matt, the Smoke. So it's with uh, their basketball players, Matt Barnes and Stephen Jackson. I've never seen it, no. Yeah. So they get like, so I'm a, I love basketball, but they get like a lot of good basketball players. But they also get like a lot of other people on their podcast. But the last question they asked, and I, was, I should have told you to start this, is who do you think uh, would be good for the podcast for this one? Oh, but but the okay. but you have to try and get them on. <laughs> yeah, so that's, <laughs> yeah. So I should I, I should have let you know beforehand. So but they, so they do it. So they um well it's just for me. I thought well for them they obviously know a lot of people and they can probably get who they want right. on. But for okay. for a new for people who are starting a new podcast, that was the I tried to start this a year ago, and um, I just couldn't find any people to come on. So have, so you, I, have you ever seen Little T Fitness on Instagram? Nah, Little T. Yeah, um, Little T Fitness. Yeah. Um, she's gotten very very big um, on Instagram. She's a gym shark athlete now. Um, over the last, uh, she, she's gotten very big over the last few years. Uh, extremely talented athlete, extremely talented gymnast, and just generally a great mover, I would call her. Um, and uh, I think she'd be a really cool person to talk to. Um, 
And uh, I think that she she would probably be very open to coming on the podcast. And I, I know her quite well. So I, I'm going to give her shoot, shoot her a message and see if she's interested and see if she'd like to uh, talk to you. <laughs> Jeez, mate. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. That'd be, yeah. that'd be awesome. Check her out. She's, she's, yeah, she's just... an uh, absolutely inspiring girl. Yeah, oh, for sure. I'll definitely um, have a look. But, mate, thanks uh, so much for, for coming on to the pod. Um, Thank you. Obviously, man, like, the vibes were awesome. We, we got through a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, do you have any like final things you want to say before we wrap up? Um, I guess like if, if you have any questions or if you want any support with movement, mobility, uh, mindfulness, any of the things that we've touched on today, um, please check me out on Instagram or check out my website. Um, that's www.evolutioncollective.online. Um, it's quite a URL, but if you find me on Instagram at evolve with Jared, you can always just click the link in my bio. Yeah. Um, awesome. Otherwise just shoot me a direct message or, uh, you know, just reach out, uh, whatever way you can find. And, um, I am doing my best to always answer messages from everybody. Um, so I will get back to you and, um, yeah, I, I I'll support you however I can. Yeah. Awesome. Mate. I'll, I'll chuck all that. Um, I'll get all that stuff. I've written it down, but just make sure I've got it right before we like, chuck it all up. But I'll, I'll I'll put that up on the um yeah on the, all the, the yeah the Spotify the Apple uh, music that's all all that stuff and the YouTube just so when people look at that you can just click onto it straight away. But yeah, thanks so much for coming on, mate, and we'll um catch everyone on the next episode.